I will be taking a different approach with the remaining double pyramids in this chapter. I will be describing the next two from the bottom up. The bottom double pyramid is known as the lapis quaternio. The very bottom dot in the chain is labeled as rotundum. The top of this double pyramid is labeled, naturally, lapis. And the edges of the middle square are the four classical elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. The rotundum can best be understood as the chaotic state of being at the beginning of time. It is the prima materia which we discussed back in chapter 11. It is the starting point from which all other creation stems. In order for the known universe to be brought forward from the chaos, it needs to be done in steps. The first step, according to Jung and the alchemists, was to bring forward the four classical elements. It is from the formless intangible rotundum, or void, that the tangible form is extracted. To those who have watched my Silent Hill 2 video on the red squares, you will remember this process as the squaring of the circle in alchemy. The circle is the rotundum, and the square is the four elements. The next step involves a unification of these four elements into one seed. Though the four elements coexisted inside the rotundum, they were not united. They were merely coexistent and had to be combined through the alchemical procedure. These four elements are united in the lapis. The lapis is not the philosopher's stone, even though it is often referred to as the lapis philosophorum in Ion. As I said, it is merely the seed with which God brings the universe to life. The lapis is also referred to as the prima materia, except unlike the prima materia of the rotundum, the lapis represents a unity of the elements instead of a chaotic disunity. The third step involves the remaining double pyramid, which is known as the Paradise Quaternio. Yes, this is the very same Paradise Quaternio which was discussed in Chapter 13. The four edges of this double pyramid, of course, correspond to the four rivers of Paradise, and they all flow from the same source of unity, the Lapis. Because the Lapis is a unity of all things, the water that flows from it is also a perfect unity of a different form. This is the Aqua Doctrinae, which we also discussed in Chapter 13. It is the blood of God that poured from Jesus' side. All of creation that exists in the Paradisal Realm stems from the nourishment of these four rivers. Eventually, creation evolves until it culminates in its highest possible state, the Serpent. As I said before, the serpent had its positive qualities and negative qualities. It is the highest in the animal kingdom, but the lowest in the shadow kingdom. It can be seen as the highest because, as we said in the last chapter, it appears to be equipped with the gift of wisdom. However, it was the lowest because, to use Jordan Peterson's words, they were hell on our primordial ancestors. It may be a being of supreme wisdom in the animal kingdom, but a human being should not strive to have its morality mirror that of an animal, and especially a snake. Let us now summarize what we have learned thus far with these four double pyramids. These four images represent a process of development for the living being. A series of steps from the formless chaotic beginning described in Genesis to the highest development of the ego culminating in the self. In each double pyramid, we see a conjunction of sorts that separates into a square, and then unifies again on a higher plane. This is the alchemical squaring of the circle. In addition, Edinger and Jung viewed this alchemical process as synonymous with the individuation process. It is by integrating an unconscious content from that lower unity, symbolized by the intangible circle, into the level of consciousness, symbolized by the tangible square, that a higher unity can be achieved. The living being continuously does this until all unconscious contents balance out with conscious contents, and they become indistinguishable from God. There are no squares left to integrate. There is only a perfect circle. These four quaternios are Jung's attempt to arrange systematically the almost limitless wealth of symbols in Gnosticism and its continuation, alchemy. 
Like we said using the archaeology metaphor in the last video, Jung investigated not only Gnosticism and alchemy, but many other religious traditions and found their patterns. He united those patterns through logical inference and brought forward this chain, a chain that portrays the structure and dynamics of the self. Or rather, the structure and dynamics the ego must go through in order to attain the self. For those who might be weary of Jung's abstraction here because it might be overly complicated and not relevant for the scientific age, I have saved one final example that will demonstrate Jung's empirical method. Once one reaches the highest point of the developmental chain, where else is there for the ego to go? It can't go higher. The only place it has left to go is back to the beginning. Thus, Jung takes the tail of the chain and puts it into the mouth of the head of the chain and creates an image indistinguishable from the Ouroboros. The only thing the ego can do once it reaches the perfect unity of the self is disunify and start again in the void. Jung makes this inference because the difference between the higher atom and the rotundum is invisible. This is because the higher atom and the rotundum contain all the necessary components of ego development. The rotundum contains everything that God derives the universe from, and the higher atom is a perfect unity of all those elements. The only thing that distinguishes the two of them is that one is an ordered unity, and one is a unity in chaos. Unfortunately, the mortal man is frequently unable to tell which is the dark unity and which is the light. As we said in the last video, the first 1,000 years of the Christian Ion could be linked to the first two Quaternios. If the Moses Quaternio reflected a spiritual period, and the Shadow Quaternio reflected a unity of the carnal man with the spiritual, the lower two Quaternios reflect a further descent from the spiritual into the material. In regards to the Paradise Quaternio, this reflects the period between 1000 AD and 1500 AD. Jung associates it historically with the emergence and development of alchemy. This is the time when the spiritual realm moved beyond the church and human beings tried to interpret the functions of the natural world through spiritual terms. In regards to the Lapis Quaternio, this is the period between 1500 AD and 2000 AD. This is when the spiritual element becomes almost completely eliminated. This period is the age of scientific materialism and the deification of matter. To quote Edinger, Jung's idea is that the whole ion, that is, the Christian ion, the ion of Pisces, has been a circulatio process through these four quaternities. If there is any truth to Jung's idea, then there are two possibilities. These possibilities are ones that we discussed back in chapter 5 and 6. One is that we are coming to the end of the Christian ion and are experiencing the extremities of the anti-Christian millennium. Those extremities are the zenith of science, but also the zenith of anti-spiritualism. The other possibility is that we have already passed the anti-Christian millennium and are now in the new ion, the ion of Aquarius. We'll discuss which of the two possibilities is more likely, but let us first justify Jung's conclusions about the anti-Christian millennium. The worship of matter in the latter half of the anti-Christian millennium reflects the Gnostic myth of the new, who, beholding his reflection in the depths below, plunged down and was swallowed in the embrace of Physis. Physis is another name for the void which birthed the natural world. In other words, the descent of Nu into Physis is much like the descent of the human mind from the realm of the spiritual into the realm of the natural. Throughout the last 500 years, there have been several key points in this drift away from God. In Chapter 7, we referenced the French Revolution, a heavily anti-Christian era. After that, the 19th century was marked by scientific materialism, and the 20th century was marked by political and social realism. To use Jung's words, it is 20th century realism which has turned the wheel of history back a full 2,000 years and seen the recrudescence of the despotism, the lack of individual rights, the cruelty, indignity, and slavery of the pre-Christian world, whose labor problem was solved by the Ergastulum, the convict camp. 
The transvaluation of all values is being enacted before our eyes. While Jung's relation of his chain to the ion of Pisces is certainly debatable, what isn't arguable is that there certainly has been a drift towards anti-religious sentiment in the last 500 years. The most recent century has arguably been the bloodiest in human history, with the various genocidal campaigns of the dictator states, all of which was justified via the aforementioned transvaluation of values. While the present has not seen this level of bloodshed, what we continue to see is the transvaluation of all values. Jordan Peterson has pointed this out with his criticism of postmodernism. The postmodern ethos asserts that there are no values and that all human beings are doing is, quote, trading power games. This ethos has pervaded the universities, influencing the core curriculum in order to reflect this ideology. We only need to look at the news to see this ethos being acted out in real time. Very often we see pundits, Politicians and perpetrators immediately drop their ideological positions if it allows them to punch their ideological opponents. At this point in time, humanity is becoming increasingly divided over ideological grounds. For example, in America right now, with the protests and the violence, we see one side saying that America is an evil racist place and the only thing that can be done is to rip it out from the roots and start over. The other side says that America is a wonderful free place and those that say it isn't are either evil or ignorant. With the COVID-19 pandemic added into the mix, we see both sides dropping their belief in self-isolation and social distancing if it means advancing their particular agenda. The transvaluation of values that occurred in the 20th century that justified the killing of millions never went away. It has only simmered in the collective unconscious for the past few decades. If we, as a species, refuse to confront that content and integrate it, it will bubble over. The violence and division we see now will only continue to get worse. That is the nightmare Jordan Peterson wishes to prevent. As for what the solution is, I refer back to chapter 6. If the first thousand years of the Christian Ion can be symbolized by the Christian fish of Pisces, and the second thousand years can be symbolized by the anti-Christian fish of Pisces, then what we see before us are two fully formed sentiments in direct opposition to each other. The solution to this, in Jung's mind, comes with the symbol of the following ion. Aquarius is symbolized as a water bearer. I gave one interpretation of this back in chapter 6. Seeing that fish swim in water, I said that the fish need to come together in the water that they share. They need to integrate the contents of their opposite in order to create a greater unity, one that is indistinguishable from the Jungian self. However, there is another way of interpreting this, one that is more worrying, but also more hopeful. If humanity continues to polarize across ideological lines and eliminate the values of our past, there will need to be people that will carry those values forward through treacherous times. We need to preserve the nourishing water, the alchemical aqua doctrine, the blood of Christ. We need to carry it forward in the new ion. The ones that are able to do this will be the ones who can be Christ-like, but not Christ-like in the Protestant sense. We need to discover the truths latent in the Christian and anti-Christian sentiment and convince our fellow man to take up this burden. To use Jordan Peterson's words, we must pick a weight and carry it. Our weight will be the water. With this book, Jung offers a potential first step forward in the new ion. Jung tries his best to unify psychological, metaphysical concepts with occurrences in the real world. He tries to unify the spiritual with the material. He is trying to unify the psyche with matter. To many, this might seem like a pointless, misdirected exercise, but to that, Jung responds, quote, Psyche cannot be totally different from matter, for how otherwise could it move matter? And matter cannot be alien to psyche, for how else could matter produce psyche? 
Psyche and matter exist in one and the same world, and each partakes of the other. Otherwise, any reciprocal action would be impossible. To conclude, I would like to address the question I posed before. Are we already in the Ion of Aquarius, or are we still nearing the end of the Ion of Pisces? Is there still a greater, anti-Christian hell that awaits us? Are we still awaiting the advent of the Antichrist? Is now the time that we need to take the responsibility of picking up the water and carrying it forward? Well, I can't predict the future, but what I do have is the ability to observe. And I do find it curious that Jordan Peterson's message of personal responsibility would resonate on a global scale at this moment in time. Whether or not that is a sign of some transcendent order telling you to be the water carrier, to pick up your load and move it forward, well, that's for you to decide. Normally, at the end of the video, I give a spiel about liking the video and going to my subscribe star. Instead, I will ask you to click on the image you see on screen now. That will take you to the final part of this series. If you have enjoyed this series, I kindly ask that you go watch it. It will be short, but important.